Okay, so this is 4.2, and today we talk about Euler's function. Euler function. So Euler function is a very fundamental notion in elementary um, kind of number theory, and let me tell you what it is. So definition, so Euler function phi of n is defined as the number uh, of uh, uh, positive integers integers are less than n and co prime to n. Okay, so um, let's see. So let me first maybe restate this. So phi of n equals the cardinality of a set of m in n such that n and m are co-prime. So we can easily compute some values of phi. So if you take phi of uh, 3, for instance, that equals to 2, because there are two numbers co-prime to 3, 1 and 2. And if you take phi of 5, 4, then uh, the answer will be, okay, so there is 1, 3, 2 is missing. And so the answer is also 2. And then you can take phi of 6, and then you can take 1, uh, 2 doesn't work, 3 doesn't work, uh, 4 doesn't work, uh, 5 works. So that's again 2. Maybe it's always 2, but no. 5 of 7 is equal to 6, because you have 1, 2, up to 6. And 5 of 8, for instance, is equal to, so you have 1, 3, 5, 7. All odd numbers are co-prime to it. And, and the answer will be 4. So you see it's it's pretty interesting function. Okay. So, um, why do we care about Euler's function? So, let me immediately explain the fundamental reason behind that. So, the fundamental reason why Euler function is so important is that, so consider z over mz. So, the fact is that there are two operations here. So, of course, it's a billion group, as we discussed. But also, one can multiply there. So define the product of two classes uh, uh, A and B by the rule A class of A times B. So that's not particularly obvious that this is indeed uh, uh, well defined because as usual with such definitions you need to check that it doesn't depend on the choice of of representatives. But if you just write down, so every element here is a plus m uh, k1, and you multiply it on any element of type b plus m k2, so when you multiply it you will get a b plus m times k1 b plus k2 a plus k1 k2 m, and you see that no matter what is k1, what is k2, this remainder modulo m does not depend on that. So that's why you can define it. And uh, of course these two uh, uh, addition and multiplication satisfy certain uh, axioms. And the axioms are that of a commutative ring. So z over mz uh, is a commutative ring. And commutative ring is the same kind of beast as fields and groups, it's algebraic structure. So let me kind of quickly say what it is. So uh, a commutative ring uh, R is a set plus uh, two operations. And now uh, one of them is usually denoted by addition and another by multiplication. And they satisfy certain properties. And, and uh, to write them down quickly, I would say that 
R with addition is an abelian group. And, and then there are some other axioms related to multiplication. So, uh, um, so one of them is that for every three elements A, B, C in R, A, B times C is A times B, C. Um, associativity. In other ones, there exists this element 1 in R, special element called identity, such that 1 times A equals A times 1 equals A. Actually, sometimes people consider rings without identity, but we will discuss it next quarter. Now it's not that important. So, and finally, there is this, uh, okay, so there is this for every A, B, and C in R, uh, we need to say how addition and multiplication interact. A times B plus C equals B plus C times A. Uh, sorry, A times B plus C uh, equals A, B plus A, C. And B plus C times A equals B, A plus C, A. Uh, you can open brackets. And uh, finally, of course, there is this commutativity axiom, and this makes your ring commutative ring. So for every a, b, and r, a times b is equal to b times a. So and I should say that though kind of almost all rings you might want to consider have like all axioms and, and maybe identity, sometimes is uh, kind of you can assume it doesn't exist and you will get still uh, interesting objects in mass. Commutativity is something uh, which you can emit and get incredibly interesting structures. So there are amazing rings which are not commutative. And we will discuss one of them in great detail in this quarter called quaternions. So this all stuff are axioms of a ring. So if you add this one as well, you will get commutative ring. And finally, if uh, uh, you can divide by any element, then uh, uh, it's called a field, and uh, I will come to that in a second. Okay, so um, another kind of definition which is immediately obvious. So we know that commutative rings are this, and then we know that there are fields where you can divide by everything. A um, very important definition is that uh, R in R is a unit, and that, don't confuse it with this unit, this is just, you know, identity element, and this is kind of type of elements in R, also called uh, invertible element. Invertible element. Um, uh, if uh, there exists R prime in R, such that R times R prime is 1. So basically, this R prime, so you can you can divide by R. So basically, R inverse exists. And you know that's not always the case. For instance, yeah, and the set of units. So so notation is is R times. That's notation for units. And you can take, for instance, you know Z, which is a ring, and you can take Z units, and you will get plus minus one. So these are invertible elements, and 1 over 2 is not there. And uh, you can take, for instance, R units, and R is also a ring, you can multiply add as usual, and you will get all elements without 0. So uh, that is what is a unit, and, and maybe also kind of definition which, which already hopefully you, you know well, especially after linear algebra class, so uh, a ring, a commutative ring R is called a field. If you can divide by anything except zero, R times is the same as R without zero. So that is what's called a field, and, and we know very well that like complex numbers, rational numbers, real numbers are fields, and Z is not a field, polynomials are not a field, and so on and so forth. So, um, next question is, okay, why we talk about all that right now? So, obviously, because I want to discuss Z over NZ from this perspective. So, Z over NZ. So, this is a commutative ring. And, uh, 
You can, of course, check, you need to check formally speaking that, that all the axioms are true, but just think about it. I mean, basically, if you know that addition and multiplication is well defined for classes, then you can open, you know, this class brackets and do the usual uh, properties of integers inside there. So, what is z over n z units? So this is an interesting question, and uh, uh, okay. So before even starting talking about it, I can say that's an abelian group. So so this is a abelian group. With basically a times b as multiplication. So, so that's an abelian group with now no, you don't use addition of a ring because if you add two units you will not get a unit in general, but you're using multiplication and obviously if you know that you know r uh, one r one prime is is one and r two r two prime is one you can multiply them you get r one r two r one prime r two prime is one and so this one is also a unit so product of units is a unit inverse of a unit is a unit and thus. Um, that's a group. So for every n, we have not just one uh, interesting group, being z over n z, but another z over n z times. These are uh, invertible remainders modulo n with multiplication as operation, and that gives us an abelian group. And of course, we know all abelian groups. They are all uh, sorry. Yeah, we know we know we don't know all abelian groups, but we know some abelian groups, and we can answer: Is it like z over something z? Is it cyclic or not? So that's all our very interesting questions. And before I discuss them, let me look at some examples. Okay, so um, so let's look at some example. Let's look at z over five z first. So uh, okay, we have zero, one, two, three, four, five. And then we can try to find inverses. So for zero, there cannot be inverse. Everything times zero is zero. So and here, so this is x, this is x inverse, and one inverse is clearly one. If I multiply by one, I get one. Two inverse is three. Two times three is six modulo five is one. Three inverse is two. Four inverse is okay, if I take four and I multiply by four, I get sixteen. So that's one. And five, sorry, five is zero. So all of these four elements are uh, units and and uh, so uh, z over 5z is a field is a field. That's this famous field with p elements. We will talk about it in a second. Um, but one can also consider another example z over 6z. And here we have 0, 1, Two, three, four, um, five, and uh, if I take this as x, this is x inverse. I mean, okay, so this doesn't have uh, the inverse. One inverse is one. Two inverse doesn't exist because I mean, if you multiply two by anything, you will get basically two, four, or zero all the time. You will never get one. So this doesn't have inverse. Three times 3 is uh, 9, module 6 is 3. Uh, wait. Yeah, so so uh, so uh, 3 also doesn't have a, um, uh, is not a unit, because if you multiply it on anything, you will always get either 3 or 0, so that's also not a unit. 4 is again also not a unit, you will get just 0 to 4 multiplying by anything, 
and 5 is a unit and the inverse is 5. And so what I get is that z over 6z is actually times is actually isomorphic to it has just two elements and the structure is multiplication is z over 2z. So you see something interesting is happening here. Um, let's maybe look at another example. Let's take z over 8z. So here we have 0, 1, let me just use, you know, I don't want to use brackets all the time, so let me just omit the brackets, I, I, I mean them everywhere. So you have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and it's really easy to see that, okay, 0 doesn't have an inverse, 2 doesn't have an inverse, 4 doesn't have an inverse, 6 doesn't have an inverse. And, and the reason is because if you multiply 2 by anything or, or 4 by anything, you will always move between these kind of even elements there, the subgroup 0, 2, 4, 6. Uh, but 1 has an inverse, and this is 1, um, x, x inverse, and, and 3 has an inverse, let's try to find it. 3 squared is 9, so that's 1 modulo 8. Uh, 5 times 7 is 35, which is 34 plus 1, so 1 and inverse of 7 is then 5. So basically there are four elements which are inverses and so we know that z over 8z is a subgroup, uh, sorry, multiplicative, is, is a subgroup so it's order 4. And abelian group, I mean even not abelian, just there are just two groups of order 4, it can be z over 2z times z over 2z or z over 4z. And so then you can start to like look at squares, one square is 1, 3 squared is 9 is 1, 7 squared is 35 is 1, 5 squared is 25, modulo 8 is 1. So all of them squared to 1, there is just one such group, so z over 8z multiplicative group is isomorphic to z over 2z times z over 2z. And, and this is kind of beautiful example. So next, I want to understand uh, what is the number of elements there. So let, let's let's understand uh, uh, at least figure out the order of this group. Okay, so uh, let's take z over m z times, and the question is: Okay, let's describe it. So uh, claim proposition is that the class A inside Z over MZ is invertible if and only if A is co-prime to M. Notice, by the way, that this doesn't depend on the representative. If you take, subtract, or add M to A, it will still be co-prime. And the and this is exactly what we saw before. For instance, for this 8 case, uh, it was 1, 3, 5, 7. That's exactly the uh, number of co-prime numbers less than m. And the proof is more or less straightforward. So I don't even know. Let's do this direction first. So a, m are co-prime. So then there exists some elements x, y in z such that a x plus m y equals to 1, but when you look at remainders it means that class of a, class of x, plus class of m, class of y equals class of 1, okay that's 1, that's 0, that vanishes, so a x equals to 1, so, uh, so a is a unit. So you see we used this, this property of the greatest common divisors, that's it's a linear combination of A and M, and they did the job. Um, backwards, so th sorry, this was backwards, now let's go forward. So forward is, um, uh, okay, so forward. So let's assume that A is invertible. So A uh, uh, is inside Z over MZ times 
that of course implies that there exists um, x in z such that a times x is 1, but then ax plus there exists b, sorry, there exists b in z such that ax plus b m equals to uh, 1. Sorry, I should say y, of course. Um, just for consistency. So there exists uh, y in z such that ax plus uh, my equals to 1. And, um, and then um, actually this implies that the numbers a and m are co-prime and the reason is imagine they are not co-prime, they are divisible by d's and both of the these parts are divisible by d's and this is divisible by d. Or you can just say that, that from this group theory perspective this just implies that the subgroup x generated by, sorry, by a and m, the subgroup generated by a and m contains 1 and then of course it's the whole z thing and then they are co-prime. By the way, it's sort of important to remember, so two numbers are co-prime when subgroup generated by them is the whole thing, z. So that finishes the proof, and in particular, so we have two corollaries. So corollary number one is that z over mz times order is given by the Euler function. So just because, by definition, this is a number of co-prime to m elements from 0 to m minus 1, and we want to take less than m because we want to take each class just once. And corollary number 2 is that, okay, so if m is prime, then uh, obviously any number less than this p is, is co-prime to p. So m uh, equal to p is prime, then uh, z over pz times is just z over pz, all elements, except the zero class. So z over pz is a field. And when we talk about it as a field, not as a group just, we denote it by fp. And that's famous field with p elements. So probably uh, you have uh, seen it in linear algebra and uh, for p equal to 2 this is this field 0, 1 kind of appearing in, in computer science all the time and we will work with it a lot even in this quarter because we will talk about linear algebra over this field and groups related to it and matrices over it and, and how they are related to other groups we know. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and uh, actually uh, there is a theorem which, which you will probably see the proof in the quarter, which is the third quarter, that every field which is finite is isomorphic to a field with p power n elements, and there is one field for each power of p, and this one is for power of p equal to 1. So that's a very, very important field. And in particular, maybe corollary number 3 is that this phi of p equals to p minus 1. And the reason is okay, because, I mean, that's obvious, right? Numbers co-prime to p less than p, p minus 1 of them. So finally, I want to do last corollary of all of that, which is called Euler theorem, Little Fermat theorem, Wilson theorem. They are complete classic, but um, I cannot resist mentioning them in this context. And then we, uh, we move on.